Okay, I think let's get let's get this rolling. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the second MSP Geekcast, um, which is our vendor spotlight with Imibot. So what we're going to do today, we're going to run through things regarding the sound of silence in terms of package and software installations. You're free to ask questions, but I'm only going to be trying to answer questions that everyone will find helpful. We're going to have a session afterwards in the v imibot channel where you can ask uh, Darren or myself any individual questions that you may have. Um, we're also going to run a few polls during this and they're anonymous, so feel free to pop in whatever you want. Uh, you're not going to get shamed for answering in a particular way. Um, so let me introduce uh, a man a lot of you will know. Uh, he's wondrous. He's illustrious he's a magician with a brain that plays like a youtube video at two speed it's darren katan darren good afternoon good afternoon well evening for you i guess yeah evening for me so the whole point of this really is to be educational i didn't want this to be like me shoving any bot down everyone's throat um but we all have a lot of struggles around getting software installed i find that uh, before i made any bot well especially now that i made any bot uh, I spent a lot of time just getting the right software on people's computers. And it's really important uh, for both getting new computers set up and also getting existing computers into compliance. Maybe you got a new customer and you got to get your stack rolled out to them and, uh, and you want to know what, how to install their line of business applications, save your technicians time and enforce consistency, things of that nature. So it's a super important thing. I think we all struggle with it with the tools that we use. And uh, and so I'm going to show you guys some of the tricks that uh, that I used and ultimately kind of bundled into Amibot. But this is kind of how I, I did it manually. And it, I'm hoping it's new to some of you guys. I, I see a wide variety of people here. So I'm expecting a, a, a wide, you know, uh, the wide base of people from maybe you're just getting into automation. Maybe you've been doing it forever. I'm hoping that there's something here to resonate with all you guys. So uh, from the, from that point four maybe it's time for our first poll right uh, yeah just, let's just let's get that kicked audience. off how good you guys are right now all right let's start this one um our first topic is going to be on uh, silent install switches uh, so this uh let's just launch this and see how this goes so uh do we allow the panelists to vote darren or can we just assume you're going to get this right <laughs> uh, you know we ought to because what if they get it wrong well, they're, we, they're, it's, it's anonymous, so we don't know. I'm not going to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'll let me launch this now. Okay, so let's okay. put that out. Um, I believe once I end this, I can share the results uh, of it, but it will be interesting to see which of these options you think will allow uh, an MSI to install silently. Oh, my God. I, I, can you see the results coming in live on your screen, Darren? Oh, maybe I have to answer it myself first. Oh, hold on. Okay. We didn't actually put up the right what the right answer was going to be, but I know which one that is. So the majority of people getting this right, which is uh, good to see. We're at about three quarters. Um, so a few, few, few answers coming in there. And then I'll share out. Uh, okay, they look like uh, they look like they're done. Uh, so Let's share those results out to everybody so everyone can see how everyone answered. All right. So nice to see the majority of you picking the correct answer there, which is the MSI exec slash I, MSI slash QN. Um, now, and, and I, know, I really do like the people that said this is a trick question you're trying to track. <laughs> I feel like that's something I would definitely do. That's, that's on brand. That's why I put that there, um, because I'm pretty sure uh, most people think the same about me as well. I did consider chucking a few right answers in there just to uh, throw people out, but I figured that was uh, that was a bit naughty, so I didn't. <laughs> you did um, good. Yeah, so what, what are we jumping on to now? It's interesting to see that because um, it's going to help us kind of guide this session based on the expertise for the for the people that are in here. Um, but well, it, hopefully it actually worked out perfect because what we, we I said, I bet everybody in here already knows how to deal with MSIs. I don't have to talk about MSIs. And Gavin's like, well, I don't know. Maybe they don't. I'm like, let's take a poll and find out. Guess what? It looks like I don't have to talk about MSI. So let's just focus on EXEs, which is what I really wanted to talk about anyway, right? So uh, 
I guess the, the first question or the first thing I want to talk about uh, is, well, you were going to ask me the question, right, Gavin? So you, you do it. Yeah. So when me and Darren were discussing this, we tried to put a, we tried to put a portfolio in here of start to finish uh, stuff that made sense for how installers work. And when I was approaching this to Darren, this is one, this was one of my first questions when we were discussing it. Why do EXC installers exist when MS, MSI has been around forever and it works so well? Well, in my experience, it has to do with prerequisites. If you open up a program that creates EXE installers, something like Advanced Installer, the first thing it lets you do is add prerequisites and it tells you, oh, you need to make an EXE bootstrapper project if you want these prereqs to be installed. So coming at it from the angle of the guy creating the installer, I'm like, oh, that's why they do this. So oftentimes you'll have an MSI inside of an EXE archive right? And you're like, why didn't you just give me the, the MSI? It's like, well, you don't have a mechanism for like getting my C++ redistributables from, you know, the beginning of time installed and updated on the computer. So like now we have to have this EXC thing. Whereas MSI actually in, under the hood in Windows registers itself in such a way that it can be cleanly removed. You know, very similar to like, uh, you know, an app in the app store with, with uh, you know, with with like Apple or something, right? There's that whole, and we're not here to get into AppX and all that, although I would love to, but I don't think we're gonna have time. Um, but yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. But the problem is it is the wild west out there with EXEs. There is no standard for how it could be built. And some software vendors don't even use an off-the-shelf packager like we're gonna talk about. They'll just go and say, oh, well, I've written everything else from scratch in C++, so why not write my installer from scratch? And then like, good luck. Right. So, uh, but we're going to try to at least go through, go over the most common ones in the low hanging fruit for you guys. And uh, y'all are going to have some good takeaways for this. All right. So, Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. So you often see those, um, you often see those uh, redistributables that uh, often occur in those EXE installers. And, uh, you know, it, and as a prerequisite, installing this and then this and then this. And like I said, that's too difficult to put into it. Well, you can't put that into an MSI as a, as a dependency for the installation, which quite limits it really. It's a bit of a, a failing of the MSI standard to take into account prerequisites. Um, and that explains why there's so many different types of uh, EXE installers. Um, so um, to move on to our next discussion point, uh, now we know about the types of installers, which are predominantly EXE and MSI. Let's talk about how we can install them silently. Uh, so. Darren, what kind of a quantity does MSI represent for us when it comes to silent installation? Man, that's a hard question to ask. Cause like I said, a lot of times MSIs are wrapped in, with these EXEs, right? So uh, I think really the best way to, to move forward is maybe we could bring up that presentation and I can start running through the different uh, packagers and how to identify them. And this is really the meat of the content for you guys. Uh, and, and I'll show you how how you could quickly identify what script or what silent flags will work for these things. So um, am I going to share my screen on this? Uh, yeah, you share your screen, Darren. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's see. Oh, wait, nope. Host disabled participant screen sharing. You might have to pull it up. Oh dear. Let me, uh, oh. Um, or just, yeah, or let me. I've, I've changed it. Try now. Okay. Oh, all right. I can do it. And let's do screen one. Actually, I'm going to do screen two and let me move you out of the way, hit share, and let me pull up this. Okay, here we go. We should have had some music to go along with this. All right, let's see here. Oh, now it's got that there, this here. Boom. All right, <laughs> we're here. I swear I know how to use PowerPoint. I have to type PowerPoint fully into my start bar because it wants to open PowerShell every time. <laughs> That's probably all the times that you uh, launched PowerShell over PowerPoint, Darren. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is probably the first time it's ever been open. Okay. Uh, who's our enemy? The EXE install, right? We hate this guy. He's the worst. Oh, uh, so uh, it, it, always got to start with the easy stuff, right? You don't, I don't want to dive so far deep, and we're going to get there, that, uh, that we ignore the obvious, all right? Um, Google the name of the software in the word silent. Like, sometimes it just works. I've got a video of that working later, and you'll see. 
There's um, a, there tends to be three types of uh, technician as you go up the skill level. Uh, there's <laughs> your tier, tier one engineer who can Google. There's your tier eight, two engineer who can Google better. And then there's your tier three engineer who's uh, the best at Google. <laughs> we, have a, we play a game at our office. We call it getting a Google ninja point. And essentially it's, I can't find this. It doesn't exist on Google. And what that means is if someone else finds it, you owe them $20. That's a good game. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce that in uh, our MSP. <laughs> yeah. So uh, even if you don't use chocolatey, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, some of the risks with chocolatey in light of the recent supply chain stuff, but uh, even if you don't use chocolatey, the chocolatey install.ps1 file that's inside of the chocolatey package, which you can just see on their website, I've got a screenshot here, um, contains most of the information that you need. So maybe you don't feel like deploying chocolatey to all the machines that you're trying to deploy the software to. Okay, well, guess what? That chocolatey package has the links to the uh, MSI or whatever the installer is, as well as the silent marks. So, so, so sorry, Dan, to interrupt. What you're saying there is to get those silent arguments out in a quick way, if it is in chocolatey, you can just delve into this and extract the arguments to install the software silently. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. So that this is one quick way that you can do that. And chocolate has a lot of stuff. So, you know, it's uh, it's a good place to check. And I see some some guys talking about, yeah, under 10, that's source forge. That's been a good one. There's a silent dash install.net is really good. I, I didn't really want to like list like all these different runs. Just start with Google and they're just gonna come up, you know. You'll you usually find that if they've got it. Um, here's another interesting angle that I used once successfully. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, Microsoft System Center uh, or SCCM, well, that's used by like big money people. So I had a situation once where I was trying to deploy eClinical Works to like a hundred uh, machines at a doctor's office and they wanted me to hand install it. I was like, that ain't gonna happen. So I just said, well, you know, we use SCCM. And they're like, oh, oh, SCCM. Oh, you need the SCCM compatible package. I'm like, yeah. And then like an hour later, I had a link in my email to an MSI that I could deploy silently. But before that, it was, no, you have to use this EXE and there's nothing that can make it go silent. So that's one angle. And you just have to consider like, if you're using SCCM, usually like you're big money. So they'll listen. Like they will have heard of it usually if they're legitimate. Unfortunately, QuickBooks hasn't gotten the memo yet, but more on that later. Okay, so this I think is really good. This is, if, take a screenshot of this. I am gonna put it up. I'm, I have a Get, uh, GitHub repo. I'm gonna be updating with all this information. Um, so one interesting angle is knowing what, uh, what the icons look like. You've probably seen these icons just in practice, but maybe didn't think uh, they were relevant. Well, guess what? The same, these can be indicative of what flags you need to use. Like I know everybody's seen install shield, but Eno setup is equally popular, although most people seem to overwrite the Eno Shield default icon. Uh, and uh, you know, install aware, I've seen this, I've seen setup factory out there. They all have very unique icons. And so if you see that, you're like, oh wait, hold on. I remember Darren said, if I see this icon, try these flags, that could be just a quick shortcut to get it get figured out, right? So uh, so yeah, there's that. Everybody get the screenshot, cool. All right. Then there's the, well, let me run up the command line and do like slash question mark. So here are some examples of packagers that will give you a nice, oh, here's how you do it, buddy. So uh, like W extractor is actually a packager that's built into Windows uh, will come out like this. Uh, uh, install shield will usually give you something like that. Uh, you've got advanced installer here. Uh, and if you reference like the names here back to the previous slide, there's like the pre-done known good silent flag. So you don't have to like actually use your brain and think, think about how to build these things out. Uh, Eno, Eno is really simple. It's just, well, actually, no, that one's, that one's interesting. Is that like an SP minus you have to throw in there? Uh, whatever, you guys can look at this later. But this is, this is pretty good. So these are like the seven or six that I've identified that will actually give you help, right? Bitrock, install mate, Eno, advanced installer, W extract, and install shield. All right. and of course, you've still got the uh, slash question mark you can use on the MSI, which have got um, parameters in there that are beyond just the silent installation. Um, you can repair packages, install, uninstall, um, and things like that. Uh, but it's the same switch slash question mark. Right. Um, now we're going to dive into the deep end. This is where it gets real fun. All right. So there's a lot of other types of installers that weren't listed in the, the easy kiddie pool, right? And, uh, and if they, and a lot of these don't, some, you know, some of these were listed, some of them were not. And uh, 
so where I like to start is, well, let's use seven zip, right? Let's start there. Can I just open this exe? And you'll notice, you'll, you guys have done this. You open an exe in seven zip and you're like, oh, there are all the files. Oh, okay, cool, that's great. Uh, but then some files you open up in 7-Zip and it looks like this, and that's like the actual components of a real executable, right? So knowing whether what you're dealing with is an exe or like a real exe versus an archive exe is, is important because then you know like where, which tools to turn to next, right? So in the case that it's an archive, one of the tools that uh, I discovered works pretty well is, uh, let's say it was built, it was a SFX built by 7-Zip, right? So 7-Zip created that EXE, a self-extracting deal. Well, some of, the, some of those will automatically run, but maybe they don't have the silent parameter in the auto run. And maybe you want to speak, but it has other parameters that are important to make it actually do its job. So it thinks it was executed by the parent executable. Some of them will do some crap like that. QuickBooks especially wants to be installed by its parent. And the way it maintains that is by passing in some crap into the underlying MSI. So it thinks it was run by the calling application and you're not trying to script it, right? So this is one technique that I found. And there are other ways to do this that I'm going to get into uh, later, but this one is really cut and dry if it just happens to be packaged with 7-Zip. I think uh, like the black point installer is this way. So uh, anyway, the uh, so this is really like th my favorite tool here, the Detect It Easy. I discovered Detect It Easy because I was taking apart the Universal Silent Switch Finder, and uh, I wanted to be able to automate the Silent Switch Finder, but it was using a program called PEID under the hood, which is a UI only application. Detect It Easy has a command line version. It actually has a full like a proper DLL like SDK you could use to to link it in. And there's a new one. I don't want to say new, but uh, Yara is like the, the fancy one that all of like the reverse engineering people are using now. I haven't really gotten into Yara a whole lot, but this one works really well and is my favorite. So uh, an example of its usage is you just type DIEC, you give it the EXE, and then boom, it dumps all your, what we call your PE headers, they're your portable executable headers. And oftentimes it will tell you, oh yeah, it's an installer and it's an Eno setup installer. And, uh, and once you know it's an Eno setup, then you just go back to my first table and then use the Eno setup uh, silent flags. Right? So does that work for all installer types, Darren, or just some or? Uh, I would say you'll get about 70 to 80% of your installers out of this thing. It is very good. Yeah, th this without this, the analyzer, I mean, probably it wouldn't be anything. Now I've had to build a lot around it because it doesn't, it doesn't work that great with like archives. It'll tell you, okay, well, this is an SFX and that's all you've got, right? So then I had to build like this recursive, like, okay, well, it's gonna extract the, the SFX and then it's gonna go and find the installer inside of there and then analyze the thing inside of it, right? So then you, know, you kind of have to do that sometimes. Yeah, but, um, and it's and certainly a good place to start as well because as soon as you know what the wrapper is, you can again, drop onto Google again and then find for that particular wrapper. So in Inno setup or any of the ones that we've listed earlier. Yeah, Inno setup, I took a step further. It, there's a uh, utility called Inno extract that works with uh, older versions of Inno, like before Inno 6, which is still really popular, the older versions that allow you to get properties like what it's gonna advertise itself in as under apps and features, the version specifically that it's installing. Uh, so we actually take it a step further and grab all of that information out so we could actually build an uninstall string for it and all of that. So, um, you know, each one of these things is its own rabbit hole and has its own tools. So that's why it's really important to know what you're dealing with on the front end, because then you know what tools you can use. All right. So, uh, so let's say it, in this, this right here is basically worst case scenario. Uh, what this is, if you guys aren't familiar with the tool strings, uh, strings is a tool that you just run, uh, you do strings and then any file and it'll just dump any uh, sequential bytes that can be mapped into like ASCII or like Unicode or whatever and then get those out. So what you'll end up with is this massive list of garbage where somewhere in there you may find something interesting like uh, some, uh, you know what I actually use this for? I look for the, uh, the presence of these, because sometimes the author will suppress the slash question mark, even though the installer natively finds it, but it will still bundle the string that puts, that displays this into their exe. And just that presence of this text inside of the exe tells me, aha, it is advanced installer, but you suppressed that help menu. 
And so now I know what to do. Those sneaky packaging people. Dude, they're the worst. And you know what? You know what they say? That, yeah, they say like never attribute to malice what could be uh, ineptitude. I think that's what it is. Like when you go to work, when you go to work for a software company, they're like, oh, we're going to, he's the newbie. Put him on the packaging team. Like you end up get, getting stuck with that. Like nobody wants to do it, which is my, in my opinion, the reason why most installers suck. I think interns are doing all of them. Anyway, um, cool. But you dump those strings out and you'll find some interesting stuff sometimes. And yeah, it's like digging through a dumpster, but you may you may get something good so uh so that's that uh all right so that's all i've got in terms of presentation but i think that was enough to at least like get you guys you know interested and hopefully we'll raise some more questions and we can you know do a discussion a little bit later on yeah so if you have any questions about any of the stuff that we've just put forward uh there fire it into the uh question and answer and we'll uh, answer some of these uh live as we uh, continue on so uh so what we're jumping into is the question you get all the time gavin you want to pose it why i do, I do indeed yeah. why does this work when i run it directly in a user interface but when i run it through my rmm it doesn't okay we need to talk about the difference between an interactive and a non-interactive session all right. So yeah, you're maybe you're running uh, as admin and you double click that thing and it pops up and it's and it's able to install and you're like, this is great. Or even if you open command prompt as admin and you've got your silent flags figured out and it works when you run it through ISC as admin or command prompt as admin, but when you run it at from lab tech, it, it doesn't work. There's two reasons why this wouldn't work. One of them is really easy and the other one's really hard. I'm gonna start with the hard one. So in a non-interactive session, whenever a, an application tells, asks Windows, hey, I need you to create a, a window for me, and it starts drawing the interface, well, you're kind of at the mercy of how that guy coded that to how to, when window, Windows will come back and say, I can't do that, sorry, you're running in a non-interactive session, and so it's going to return a, an error. Well, if your installer doesn't know how to deal with that, if it says, oh, well, wait, I don't know what to do now, and it just shuts itself down, that's a good reason why it wouldn't work right but a lot of installers handle that situation gracefully every now and then you'll have an installer that when you run it in an interactive session will create the window but if the window fails to create because it's in a non-interactive session it'll just suppress the rest of the windows that are going to get created because it knows it needs to install silently not all installers are that smart in fact i would say the vast majority of them are not that smart so if you're in that situation man you're in for a hard time your best bet is to really use some of these tools that we have here to see if there's any hope of suppressing those windows from coming up. Uh, and if there's absolutely no way because you're dealing with some really obscure software that has to be hand installed, I would start looking at repackaging it with AppX, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, some people brought up, oh, why not use like um, uh, auto IT uh, to make it like a little interactive thing. Oh my God, I've wasted more hours doing that probably than figuring out silent stuff, just getting the number of tabs right and the control keys and the loops and oh, what if it loses focus or something happens outside of that, I, I would really recommend not trying to like automate a manual process. That's that's my experience. Your mileage may vary. And um, it's, yeah. it's also um, like based on the session that it's running in as well. And Pete, I think some, some people can think that the system session is some magical unicorn of a session that's nothing like the standard user consoles that run when people are logged on. And one of the things that I want to put forward when we're talking about this um, system or user divide, a lot of the time, especially if you're using something like um, ConnectWise Control, you can go into Backstage. And when you launch something in Backstage in Control, it launches in the same session that your RMM would tend to use when it's running. I know that would certainly be the case for ConnectWise Automate. And I'm sure it's the case for a lot of other RMMs that run in the system context when they are launching these things. So it's a really good way that of figuring out whether this is a you problem or whether it's a problem with the actual installer because it behaves exactly as it does when your RMM launches it. So that's something to bear in mind. Well, and I'll, I'll just throw a couple of caveats to that in there. If you're going to be doing it through control, I actually hate backstage and control and I'm going to burn me. Right. Okay. But the reason is because burn the witch. because a, you can't open ISC. It doesn't render properly in the backstage. So if you've got these elaborate PowerShell scripts that do these installs, like I like to write, 
when you go to paste it in, it'll get all jacked up at the command line and then your script doesn't work right. And you think it was your script, but really it was just because you pasted it in the backstage. So instead, I just use that little command window and you just prepend it with pound bang PS and you can put whatever you want inside of there, assuming you have your timeout configured also and it doesn't time out. That to me is the most, if you're you know using it, uh, that tool, that's, that's the most act, quickest, easiest way to get a system uh, context and you can do a multi-line string. So hey, that's my experience there. The other thing also, like the other way you could do this, and this you have the same problem with the multi-line, is you could do ps exec slash uh, dash i for interactive dash s for system command here, and then that'll open a, up. Oh, I'm not running as, mm -mm, got me, all right. Oh, I got it, okay, cool. Yeah, ps exec dash i dash s cmd, Okay, now I'm running as actual system and you know you're running a system. Oh crap, well, I guess maybe I didn't do something right because usually if you're running a system, if you try to open no that it doesn't work. Um, yeah, that's that's another way you can do it. Maybe it's not dash I, maybe you have to do this. Oh yeah, I think that is it. Haha, -ha. see, notepad didn't open because it can't create a window handle from a non-interactive session. That's it. Yeah, I should have probably not done dash I, that means interactive. Okay, so that's another way you can do it. Um, Cool. And the whole purpose, like just so you guys understand the underpinning of that, is because all these things run as services and services in Windows by default run as system. So that's why, including PS exec. All right. Um, someone mentioned in the chat that the PowerShell plugin um, that they're using uh, is excellent as well. And I just add on if you're using Automate, and I probably a number of people here are, uh, you can use the command window that is actually in Automate as well. That can run PowerShell and command and runs in the system context. So anything you put into there will go into the system context. Right, but you also you still have the problem. What, is it a plugin you're talking about? It's just like the default automate. I'm talking okay. about the default automate command prompt. Uh, so the one that you can get in the actual agent window um, runs right. a system. It's still Although online. it doesn't help you with your GUI related uh, problems that you're likely to encounter. Um, it can yeah. certainly tell you what happens when you raw, execute it raw. Yeah, again, good for one liners, but it doesn't support multi line yeah. execution. No. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, cool. All right. So we've talked about that. Oh, oh, and then hold on. But here's the easy one, right? I said there was a hard and an easy one. So we're talking about the hard stuff. Let me tell you something that maybe you don't realize about automate. That sucks. Let's say you've got everything right. And your script looks something like this. Start process uh, dash wait dash no new window uh, setup.exe and argument list slash s what's going to happen when you run that in automate is it going to work gavin if you run it from within automate mm -hmm. um let me see start process i'll give you a hint no what what it's not going to work why ready <laughs> okay, I'll see what you're getting at. <laughs> uh -huh. So just for those of you who aren't aware of this feature, um, Automate does this cool thing where if your line ends or if your string ends in a double quote or single quote, even if there's a space behind it and multiple line breaks and it counts for things like this too, it will strip it and it will go in like that. It will strip the first one and your syntax will be wrong and your script will hang forever and ever and ever. Unless you escape the speech marks or whatever you want to call them. You can't, you literally can't. The only way you could do it is, is to make it not end with one of these. So you would have to do, so like what I do to get around this, since like, you know, in Emmy, we're using automate for that execution and we have to deal with this bug, we will add a semicolon to the end and we will do, it will add a pound like that to the beginning just to get around it. And then, and this is a gotcha, like I've seen this countless times, but I was with script work, you ended or started with a single double quote. Like, yeah, that'll, that'll do it too. So anyway, just want to bring that out there just for people who are trying to do this with automate. It's fun stuff. All right. And that's true with command line too. You have to, we do REM in front of it and then do like REM after for like the, what do they call it? I have a brain fart right now, but that's like the comment remark. That's like comments and batch. So that'll get around that problem. 
So you were talking about the easy install uh, before we uh, accidentally digressed into oh, yeah, Automator. The, oh, <laughs> it, well, the deal was, okay, the easy problem to fix was just add, a, add, you know, add something to the end or beginning of it so it doesn't get hung in the script engine because of that bug. I'm with That's you. the easy fix. That's I'm with something. you. It's nice to have an easy fix once uh, once in a while for Automate. Right. Cool. Um, so uh, do you have anything else you want to add on um, system or user context, Darren, or should we, uh, should we move oh. on to our... Well, let's see. We were talking about... Um, uh, oh, H key current user, right? That's a lot of installs take advantage of the fact that they're running interactively, theoretically, as the user who's going to be using it. So they'll go and stuff things inside of H key current user, which sucks. So uh, if you need to go and uh, modify the registry, there's actually a great PowerShell script uh, from the guys at PDQ that will ultimately mount all of the ntuser.dats, which are the files that contain HK current user for each user, and uh, will let you modify the contents of those registries. So what I've done is I've wrapped that up in a nice little uh, function that will allow you to just go and write whatever values you want into every single user's registry. So that way you don't have to wait for the user to be on the computer for you to, uh, to execute something. And, uh, and we're seeing more and more of this. So, you know, I think Chrome kind of kicked it off, but now Teams uh, it's uses that Squirrels installer technology, which, which puts itself in as the user context so it can self-update without local admin privileges. You're seeing a lot more of this stuff. And consequently, the config files live inside of the user's app data or they live inside of HKEY current user. But when you're running a system, you don't have HKEY current user. So you have to use a trick like that or set up a log on script or hope that the user is logged on and you can use like Kelvin's invoke as user module uh, or you could uh, use something like, uh, what was uh, you know, like the, Mar that's just wrapping the Mario JU thing, which is what I was gonna talk about. So you can use something like that. Or uh, you can use, if you're using automate, you could say, you know, run as user like console, was it execute console, where you could say, you know, console user one, if you get the one who's actively running it essentially spawns it from the LT tray instead of from the service so that way you are running as the user so it's not easy to do it sucks um but yeah that those are ways you can deal with that and as you probably can see from this from the areas that we're discussing here there's many areas of complication when it comes to installing software there's many different paths that you can take and there's no necessary right or wrong way of doing it, it's about looking at what that installer is doing. You know, is it putting per user components onto the machine, or is it just sticking it all in H key local machine? Um, right. Is it putting files that exist in user locations um, that that are needed? Um, sometimes, um, what I've done that can help it when I'm really struggling is watch what an install does when you in something like Process Monitor mm -hmm. um, when I'm running it to just see what it's doing and see where it's writing um because times can when you're running it interactively it can do it can behave differently than when you're not running it interactively and you can you can see what it's actually doing in the background what it's writing to the registry where it's writing it what files it's putting onto the disk um is also pretty helpful to look at when things are gone right down hard street yeah it, so something that's really common that we have to deal with nowadays that sort of dovetails off of this is setting default PDF handlers, setting default browsers. Microsoft decided that they wanted uh, they, they wanted the user to be in control of this, right? So what they did is they created the user choice hash. And what this is ultimately is, uh, is it's, if you'll, you'll know if you go into like set file types, right? Um, whatever you change that, it goes and writes the special hash in the, uh, in the registry that's actually uh, encoded with the user SID and uh, the date and some other stuff that makes it impossible for you to tweak. So if you've ever had the, oh, the default file handler association has been defaulted back to Microsoft Edge when like before Edge Chromium or whatever, that's because something tried to touch that and then Windows recognized, oh crap, that hash doesn't validate anymore. It's something's messing with it and it resets it back to the default handler. So anytime you as a user are going in here and you're reassociating stuff or you're trying to do it programmatically, you may invalidate that hash. So the, the trick that's been out, and this has been out for a couple of years, has been using the Colby.cz guys uh, set user FTA, uh, but there's something newer that I wanna show you guys. So this guy right here, he's awesome if you ever email him, by the way. Um, he made this set default browser, set user FTA. He figured out how to regenerate that hash 
and he's got a little utility that he that he released that lets you do that. And this works for uh, it works for protocol handlers too. I think those are protected by the same hash. But then this other guy came along, and uh, he's with a company called Danny Sys. Actually, I've got the link to it right here. And he released a tool, but he wrote it. He actually open sourced it, unlike uh, Chris over at Colby. And uh, his initially was written in, in real basic. And I was like, hey, bro, do you think you could like package this whole thing up as a PowerShell script instead of like taking this, this like chunk of binary out of shell 32 that generates the hash and like wiring it into this basic script? And, uh, and he was like, yeah, I'll think about it. And then a few months later, sure enough, he did. And it is some of the most beautiful PowerShell I've ever seen. If you get down into it, you can see where he's doing all this low level bitwise manipulation. Here he's doing like, rotates and magic numbers shift right shift left like oh it's crazy all to regenerate that hash and uh and i and so what i'm working on right now is what if i could combine the pdq approach of mounting the user's registry from system and then get that user sid and then feed it into this thing and from system go and set the the handler for every user profile that exists on the machine right wouldn't that be cool so I'm, that's something i'm working on in my spare time but i've uh, never even heard of this until we started discussing it when uh when you put it forward um i, I want to double up on what you said before darren because it, mm -hmm. it's a it's a really helpful uh, thing that kelvin um wrapped and created with the uh, invoke dash as current user in fact i believe he had over a million downloads of that from the powershell gallery um recently which is an obscene amount of installs um but that's really helpful when you just need to invoke something into the user session not not necessarily even a software installation if you want to put a pop-up in there or you want to put a file into the user desktop um fantastic resource so um i'd suggest having a look at that even though it does relate to software installation in a way it's still still great yeah, I, I see Derek over here is talking about active setup. That is a, actually a great way to to get things to run as the user. Active setup is that little thing that pops up at the, before the uh, Windows Explorer has already started and allows you to go and run code. Uh, as like a, it's like a logon script, but it prevents the user from doing anything. So if maybe you're trying to tweak some Outlook settings and you don't want them to have Outlook already loaded, you can set up an active setup script. The problem is active setup scripts only run once and then it remembers that it already ran. So it'll never run twice for the user unless you increment the version anyway. So um, I'll now that you brought that up, I'll drop that in the silent scripts, but this is a PowerShell function that, <laughs> that creates a VB script that call that then calls a PowerShell script. And I use the VB script to suppress the console window of the, I actually got an email from Blackpoint the other day because they saw this running on my computer and they were like, um, why is this VB script calling some PowerShell? I was like, ah, that's just some, some of my handiwork. Don't worry. It's legitimate. It's totally um, legit. They're like, you're making our job. <laughs> right, Darren. Uh, to move on, Darren, because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, time. We've got 20 minutes left. So okay. I, I think we should move on to... Um, the once it's once we've got the installation onto the uh onto the machine um mm. how do we make sure that it stays on there how do we make sure it gets to the right people and how do how do we look at that yeah so i think that's actually the biggest value add that that we have with emibot is our rules engine we have really clever ways of of assigning things you might say oh i don't i don't need that tool because i'm just going to script it all out but it will quickly get out of hand if you let it. Your initial uh, install might just, you know, might be enough, but then all of a sudden an update comes along and, uh, and the user says, oh, well, I've got, uh, I need the, I don't want it on this computer, right? Like maybe the, uh, maybe this guy is uh, using a laser welder CNC machine and it can't have that program. So then you've got to go in and you make an EDF and you say, okay, don't put this program on this computer when this checkbox is checked, right? But then maybe you replace that computer a little bit later and that EDF that was tied to that machine is no longer tied to that machine and you accidentally install the software that's fundamentally incompatible with, uh, with that machine, right? So what we try to do is more focus on the association of the user to the computer. And this is something that SCCM actually does. 
we go in and we harvest, okay, well, what is the UPN of the logged on user? Do we see that person in, person in Azure AD? Yes, okay, what groups are they in? So you're able to target groups of people and then Imibot will automatically figure out what machines it needs to go to, right? Because your, user, your users don't know the names of their machines, most likely, I mean, mine don't. And we don't always keep up with it. So you know, we might have this guy using a machine that was named after this guy to, that hasn't worked for their for that company in like two years, right? And so it's your text job to try to figure all that out. And the best tool that we have is, well, let's look at the last logged on user and automate, hoping that that guy was at work today and actually logged on the machine or whatever. Uh, so it sort of sucks. But it, but when you get to that point, it's like, okay, well, yeah, I've got, you know, I'm the dog that caught the car. I can get all the stuff to install silently. But how do you get it on the right machines, right? And uh, if you look at it from the perspective of like an MSP, we've got our software that we want to go on every client's machine, right? Like the, maybe it's our, maybe we're a Mimecast shop. So we push that Mimecast add in for Outlook. And maybe we want a third party software like a Chrome and uh, it, it, you know, whatever installed on the machine. Maybe Notepad++ or 7-Zip needs to go on all the servers and we want Windows updates and that goes to everybody. But then, you know, every client's got their own software that needs to be there. And maybe this one particular guy is the only guy that needs QuickBooks or, you know, this one specific computer shouldn't have this other thing, right? You have to get really granular. And I find that EDFs just get out of hand because they're too closely knit to the computer or they're too... Uh, too wide for like a client, you know, and people will try to say, well, I'm going to put it under this location. Okay. Well, what if there's a computer that theoretically needs to be in both locations because whoever's using it wears both hats. Right. So I find that like the traditional tools that we've used don't accommodate that. Whereas like I had a scenario where we replaced SCCM for a school we work with and the guy comes to me says, oh, well, I need to make sure that I get this, uh, this engineering program installed to the sixth grade class with Miss So-and-so. And before I could even finish the sentence, he's in Emmy. He sees, oh, wait, all the teams with all the students are in the AD groups list. He clicks it. And then all of a sudden, all the machines for all the students that it needs to be on are there, right? So I think that's really powerful. It and, is. Uh, and I think... Um... Now we've kind of looked at method, different methods to do this. Um, I know one of the questions that is going to be on people's minds and what they have put forward as well in the question is, how much time can this actually save me through writing my own automate MSI install scripts or my own PowerShell scripts? Um, and I know you've put something, a little something together for that, uh, Darren. I did. I did. All right, hold on. Let me, let me get it pulled up. Let me get it pulled up. We have a uh, YouTube video that we are going to show that I just got done today. All right, here we go. So we can't hear any uh, audio on that, uh, but uh, the- uh, Here we go. How about, can y'all hear now? No. No? No. Oh, Black man. Oh. Maybe you can just talk uh, over yourself, Darren, and we'll uh, okay. have a bit of live dubbing. All right, yeah. All right, so it's not important. All it is is uh, we're going to jump into a head-to-head, -head, you'll see it in a second, for between how you do something in Emmy versus how you would generally do it in Automate. So it's going to kick off now. Obviously, I sped this up because it just takes an eternity to, to do certain things. So uh, on the left side, I know I ripped through it, but it ended up being three minutes total to upload the file. Emmy picked the right script. It No changes needed to be made to the package. We hit deploy on the computer, and it went. On the right side, um, over here, trying to figure out why LabTech isn't downloading the file that I uploaded to the LT share. I go through multiple... Uh, <laughs> multiple moving it to different folders, trying to restart services, finally get that thing going. And uh, at the end of it, it took me 23 minutes and it would have taken longer had I uh, actually tried to fix the problem. I broke down and uh, put it in Azure blob storage somewhere because the it, it actually took more than like three hours before that indexer service just found the file and added it to the list of available things to download in iOS. 
that, that right hand side looked uh, very familiar um, <laughs> to me. Debug, wait, move on. Debug, wait, broken, start again. Debug, right. wait, missing, restart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it takes forever. Like literally the time it took for the debugger to load was the time that Amy, but like, that was the full duration of time that I was able to deploy the thing start to finish. And that was only one part of it, right? And I had to wait for the thing to load multiple times. I mean, uh, it, it, yeah, it's brutal. So I think we're uh, going to move, uh, talking of the uh, wondrous Amy bots, um, I believe that's where we're going to move on to next, Darren, if... Uh... If you're ready. Uh, are you talking about just going into the Amibot channel and we can start answering questions or? Um... Uh, no, do you, do you have anything you want to go through in terms of uh, any kind of practical demonstration for Amibots or? Well, I was gonna, I was kind of relying on the video for that, but then I shortened it up so much that it would probably be worthwhile for me to, to do that. Um, but yeah, let me go ahead and run through just like a, uh, a very simple scenario. So let's say, let's say I was actually trying to do the thing that I just did. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to log in and I'm going to say, all right, we need to deploy this software to whatever computer. So I'm going to go to software. I'm going to go to upload and I'm going to say, upload a file, grab this. And I conveniently have a folder called installer tests that contains all the installers that should just work out of the box. So let me go ahead and grab, which one should I go with? You know, I spent a lot of time doing, um, doing EXEs and I probably should because that was what I said was the hard thing. So let me go ahead and grab this guy. All right, so this is a Airtame lets you stream to, uh, uh, to a, the, using like the AirPlay protocol to like a TV or a computer or something. It's uh, some, some people use it for conference rooms. Anyway, so this is going to upload, and I don't have the greatest upload speed, so I probably should have gone with something a little bit uh, smaller to demonstrate it. But ultimately, once this thing uploads, it kicks off this analysis task that does all the work that we sort of went over in that PowerPoint, right, where it's running detected easy, it's figuring out what string matches, oh, okay, this thing is this, okay, I'm going to extract that, and then let me get the properties out of it, let me recommend the right script, and, and all of that. Uh, then it takes that output, selects the right script, and you have the option of customizing it. So let's say you do need to plug in a license key or something like that. You don't actually put the license key in the script. We give you a license file or a license value, depending on whether it's a license file or like a string, and that goes into your script. So that way your scripts can be reused across clients, and you can assign different licenses for different for the same software going to different computers. We had a scenario where we're deploying Foxit, but one of our clients already had their own license for it. So we kind of had to abstract that out to make it uh, to make it work in both scenarios. That way we could have a very concise list of scripts that uh, we could be reused across almost any installer. And also almost all of them have the name of the packager. This is the default Bitrock. This is the default Wix. This is the default install shield. So in this case, it knows that this was an you know, setup package and it even gives you the link to the, the help on that if you wanted to, but you don't actually need it because you're just gonna go through here and you're gonna say, all right, yeah, this is gonna go, uh, it's gonna be called Airtame. It's gonna put itself in the software table is that. Um, I have to put a little star there on this guy. Uh, pull the version out of it. It knows it's an Eno package here and you can take a look at that script and that's what the Eno package needs. Let's say you did need to add some extra parameters. You can say copy is new and you can start typing in, you know, my extra, whatever. Um, but the real thing uh, that I think you'll find as MSP is, is that you probably don't have to do this all that often unless you're dealing with a, a client's line of business app because as an MSP and having worked with a bunch of MSPs since we launched back in June and we had also our, our beta testers that helped us, we've uploaded a lot of this stuff already and we have known good silent scripts for it. So if you start digging through this, like I know the big thing was QuickBooks and I've got to do a shout out to, to, to Dimitri over there for helping us with that. And then also uh, uh, got one of the guys from uh, Green Loop who's here on the MSP Geek now. He, uh, so Dimitri took a script that I had started writing with QuickBooks and then uh, got it to where it would work on literally any version of QuickBooks. And if you go and look at this thing, it is just a monster script. And uh, 
it, 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 it figured, he figured out how to self-extract it and what MSI parameters needed to be fed in based on what the what type it was. So now literally at the end of the day, this thing's packaged. You come in here and you say, okay, uh, Mr. Client, you're still on QuickBooks Premiere 2018. Um, we're going to, we'll go ahead and deploy that on all your computers. And that way, when we set up a new computer, we don't forget it. So it's going to come in here. There's all the, so let's say it's QuickBooks Premier 2021. You got to put in your product number, your license number, and you tell it, you know, desktop server, or whatever. And, uh, and then you just deploy it to that client. And it's, it's that easy. And in terms of stuff that MSPs use, we've got things like Duo and Cloud Radial and Huntress and uh, just countless uh, tools that are really common in our field that you generally would not find in Chocolaty or, uh, or you know, Winget or whatever the, the package repo of the day is or Ninite or whatever. So, so, to, um, so to, to put that forward in basic terms then, what Amy mm -hmm. is doing here is you, it's already got a huge back catalogue of software in it that is tends to be ones that MSPs are deploying. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also... And that installer magic at the at the beginning was wizardry, just being able to put in a file there and it just automatically takes everything and just knows what to do to silently install it. So I'm sure anyone using this would have those line of business applications that we all know everyone has that no one's ever seen before. There may be from, you know, 10 years ago, there's nothing on Google um, and you can just feed it into that and have those have that done for you but done for you in a way that what you're demonstrating here were, would allow you to then install that out to the computers that you have inside Imibot. but it, does, is that right from the top level yeah that that's it i mean the whole point is like you could spend a lot of time packaging all this stuff manually but we've already done the work my real goal is to try to eliminate duplication of efforts you know when we met back in 2016 at automation nation and i started talking to a bunch of the guys that ultimately formed this community I realize we're all writing the same scripts. We you know we're, we've all written the Office 365 install script, right? Why, why are we all wasting that time? Why can't there be a way that we can share this in a way that is easy? And I know that in LabTech you can export and import scripts, but there's tie-ins nowadays to systems that uh, that Automate just doesn't understand. Like for example, the way that you go down here and you say, "All right, I want this to get installed on any user that has a license for it." Right. So in Emmy, it just simply says get Emmy Azure auth header. Since we're already talking to the graph API, we are now authenticated so we can go and grab the license details. And this will work for any of your CSP customers. So when you're going to onboard a computer and you say, oh, yeah, it's going to be John Doe at this customer, it goes and looks up what John Doe's got. And if he's got a project license, it'll install it. If he's got a Visio license, it'll install it. If he's supposed to have apps for enterprise, it's going to install that. You know, same with. Uh, ask for business, depending on his license. So that way your tech doesn't have to think about that and know what that client's supposed to get, right? So this is tying into 365 in the back end implicitly to the clients that you have as an MSP. Exactly. And then like a while back, Kelvin had published a, a script for like your uh, Azure secure score or something like that. And, uh, and that really inspired me. I was like, well, maybe I can make a maintenance task because we've got that this other concept. We can deploy software or maintenance tasks, which are just kind of like generic scripts, if you will. And, uh, and now we have the ability to deploy those to, uh, yeah, here it is, check Azure secure defaults. And this is a different type where instead of deploying to computers now, you're deploying to your tenants, right? So you can go and instead of having to loop, get a list of all of your customer contracts and uh, loop over them, you would then just have uh you would just tell emmy to do it and emmy's gonna handle looping all of them and giving you the output for each one of those if you want to know what the secure defaults or whatever it is if you go and check this guy out it's it's literally kelvin's code just wrapped in a small uh wrapper here that goes and does it this is the whole thing he gets everywhere that kelvin oh i know what, what a guy oh, I, should, I need to propose to him already i've already proposed i'm taking him for my own ah uh, <sighs> I don't think my wife will be very happy about that, though. Yeah, yeah, my dear. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the this is the kind of stuff that you could do once you're inside of it. And I like to pitch Emmy as as more of like a next gen uh, sort of automation tool since we're born in the cloud. And and you know, it's it's I don't know, it's new. And I'm sure in 20 years it'll be the old thing, right? But it's the new thing now, in my opinion. So anyway.
So, so uh, we, we've had a few questions come in, uh, Darren, through the through the topic of conversation. There was a, there was one relating to chocolate here, something that uh, Mark put forward um, a while ago that I just want to draw back to when we're talking about um, chocolatey, um, mm -hmm. and he's talking about supply chain attacks. And absolutely, Mark, you are a hundred percent correct when you are dipping into those. Um, repositories that exist in chocolatey the free ones you are vulnerable to supply chain attacks there's no doubt about it it's, it's the same with any powershell module that you run um some of you may know i've i wrote the automate api and I'm, i may as well say this but in one of the in one of the underlying scripts in the psi i put in the ps1 i put a note in powershell that says if you actually read the through the module before installing this come and ping me and tell me and i've had about six or seven people ping me and tell me that they've seen that you you have to be careful when you're installing stuff from the powershell gallery you have to inspect the code to make sure that it's right if you are running things like um lt posh or things from directly from github you should be forking that into your own repositories checking the code and then going forward with that so you're spot on uh, mark um they are vulnerable to supply chain tax and you need to be careful with them doesn't mean that you can't use them though use the installer logic that's in there use the heavy lifting that people have already done in terms of this chocolatey installed up ps1 to see how to do it but be very careful about what you tie yourself into with chocolatey and i actually think chocolatey is a great product um you just have to be careful with how you use it would you say that's uh Oh yeah, and in the way we took the walled garden approach with Emmy, uh, you know, guys like Dimitri have contributed, but all of this code goes through us. We look at it, we audit it. Uh, the the repo that is shared among all of the the Emmy bot instances is read only for everyone but us. So we go in, we make the changes, we audit all the code, we do that, and I really do try to avoid reaching out to PS Gallery for modules. Uh, and, and things like that. You know, I do use LT Posh, so I'm guilty of have, having done that. Uh, and there are a handful of scripts that do rely on a PowerShell gallery stuff, but the end game is to internalize all of that. So that way, you know that the code is self-contained, there's auditability, there's traceability there. And there's, they are absolutely right targets for people who are targeting MSPs. In fact, they're an easy target for people who are targeting MSPs. We talk about us being attacked for security directly. Um, and the big vendors for PSA and RMM being attacked, it can all it can take is one, just one weak link in, say, chocolatey, and your entire your entire agent pushes out an update that oh look now you've all got they've well, all got a rootkit or equivalent. But you know, I heard an argument to that is well, why wouldn't they just go and attack Adobe? Like if they could just put uh, an exploit in Adobe Reader self updater, then like. You know, that's even because now you're getting all the enterprises that don't even use chocolatey, right? They are doing the <laughs> that are installing the stuff themselves and they're leaving the auto update on. It's it's crazy. It really is. I want to pick on uh, up a question from Kelvin. Um, he says, so Imi does an analysis of the installer when you upload a package. Does that do it based on the vendor of the installer wrapper? So MSI, Ensys, etc. Exactly. It's classifying it based on what produced it. So if install shield made it, if Bitrock made it, if uh you know, you know, setup made it. My the way I discovered the pattern here is I had written a lot of silent scripts and I took the EXEs. And once I discovered how the universal silent switch finder was using one of these PE header dumpers, I put it all in Excel and I said, okay, well, here is the PE headers for this EXE and this is the script that worked. And I went and cleaned it all up and I realized that, oh, wait, hold on. Every time that it had this PE header, this was the silent flag that worked. And then I was able to consolidate a whole bunch of my scripts. And now I've got them down to like maybe 20 unique scripts for each of the packagers. Excellent. Um, one of the other questions that came in, um, can you hook into the graph API for Azure government? Uh, hmm. I, I want to say yes. I have one customer that's on it. I haven't tried. I haven't tried. Okay. Um, on next question. Uh, when running software deployments on a client through Imibot, does it only run one time or can you enforce the software to auto install for all computers on the client going forward? Okay. So the, I like to parallel Imi to group policy uh, in, a, in a way that when you go into Imi and you make your, what we call our deployment rules, and you say that uh, this, this software needs to get installed on 
all computers, all whatever. A lot of people get a little nervous because like, whoa, 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 I have all my computers in here from Automate. Is it going to just like push this out? No, 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 no. It doesn't work like group policy in that, you know, group policy will automatically do a GP update, if you will, and it will pull and enforce those settings. This is just the rule for the future whenever a, what we call maintenance session runs on the machine and we're trying to enforce the desired state. So the idea is, uh, if you wanted that to happen, you would create a schedule. And this is kind of like doing the IMI equivalent of a GP update force, where you might select a whole group of computers and say, run maintenance on those machines, where we then evaluate all the rules that have been created and for each machine and say, okay, you get this because your primary user is that, and he's got a license for this, or, you know, you get that because this user is in this group, or you get this because you just are for that customer, or you get this because the MSC pushes this to everybody, right? That's, that's sort of how that works. Um, so one of the other questions that came in, uh, do you have any uh, data or auto task integration in the works? Um, okay, so there's two hook points there. The first integration that we're going to be doing is uh, is just installing their agents. And I've got a bunch of guys that have uh, made the Datto agent uploaded into their own instance, but I believe the Datto agent is keyed with some information. So I can't like make it like I did with Cloud Radial, where with Cloud Radial, you'll plug in your API keys and we can just figure out where to get the installer from and what uh, what the client mapping is and all of that. It's stupid easy. But with Datto, because the installer, I believe, is keyed with some information uh, for your tenant or your customer, and I don't believe there's an API that we can pull that. So you have to like upload your own. You may have to do some manual mapping with parameters. So I don't have a great... Uh, I don't have a great uh, integration with that at the moment, but I've had a lot of people offer to help me with it. So, so uh, p- probably a question from me that I think I would be asking if I was sat uh, if I was sat at home or, or at work watching this. What kind of level of integration does it need to have with my PSA or RMM uh, in me? But what what's actually required to run it? Well, it depends. Okay, right. So with an RMM, the integration that we initially came to the table with was give me a list of computers, give me the ability to run PowerShell against them. We didn't want to have to push our own agent to every machine. We wanted to leverage the agents that you already have. So we are able to do that with Automate. We're able to do that with uh, with Control. And, uh, and that allows us to do interesting things like fix the Automate agent using the Control agent, right? Which Gavin knows all about. Uh, so we've got our own mechanism for doing that inside of IMI now. Um, but then people started approaching us that are using in central and we're like, oh crap, we don't have that. We don't have that. We're like, we don't care if you don't have like a full integration like you do with automate, but could you at least do some sort of integration that would allow you to install our agent, like the, 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 you know, the data RMM agent or the, uh, in central agent. And I'm like, uh, I could probably do that. So I started digging into how could I get that installer, uh, out of like in central, for example, and, and get that pushed as part of like that initial computer setup. Uh, but in that case, you, we're still running our scripts over our own agent, and you would have done the install of our agent using like the USB stick thing that installs the agent and skips out of box stuff. Um, and then our agent will then install your RMM agent. And we do the same thing for Automate too. So what most of our clients do is they get that USB stick, they put it on the bench, new computer comes out of the box, plug it in, ME agent. Okay, uh, we have the Automate agent set to go out to every single uh, computer, no problem. That's just part of that initial sequence. And that kind of does more than obviously just the RMM agent. It does everything that you have uh, in IMI essentially uh, attached to that particular client. Exactly, exactly. So like if I had to show how this works, like if I were to hit like run maintenance on my, oh, this is a really bad idea. Uh, it'll surprise me. Uh, Aaron gets kicked out of the Zoom. We know uh, yeah, y'all are gonna know <laughs> Zoom's <exactly> updating. <laughs> Yeah, so what this is doing is it's going to, it's, it's, it's queued up the session. It's going to pop up in a minute and it's going to say, oh, we're evaluating all the rules. And there's a nice little progress bar and it's going to show you that. And then you're going to start seeing all the actions that need to be performed to bring my computer into compliance based on the rules that were uh, set, you know, to run against my machine. And of course, I'm on like a beta version of, uh, of our code. So this may take a minute, but you'll, uh, what I could do is pull up a session that has already happened. So if I look at like a scheduled session, for example, and mine's the worst one to use. There are like a million broken things that I've used to test against my own machine. But um, if I go to, yeah, all of these should bring it up. Show the session, do it. I saw one of the things I'd, I'd put forward about Amy Button, the, the experience that 
kind of I've had with it is one of the best resources that I think Kimmy Bot has is Darren. Um, I see him all the time in the Imibot channel answering questions day, day and night. And when you give this man a problem, he's driven to solve it. You fire him an installer that you don't think can be installed silently and tell him, I don't think you can sort that out. He'll find a way to get that sorted out. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for the, you won't, you can't. <laughs> uh, let's see, hardest part of ME development so far, function I'm most proud of. I really like the the install analyzer. That's probably my favorite. Uh, the, the hardest part is, I would say, uh, is just keeping up with testing. We got a large surface area of code. Now it's both the underlying code and the code the PowerShell code that is uh, doing all the installs. So um, we're actively recruiting people to be on our team to help uh, with that and uh, you know, increase the overall quality of, of what you get inside of Emmy. Uh, let's see. Gavin, you're still there or you muted yourself? I'm still here. I was just reading through some of the remaining questions. Um, how does Emmy deal with time zones? Better now. <laughs> as of about a month ago, everything was relative to central standard time because, you know, the world resolves around Louisiana, according to me. Um, but now it, when you go and you create a schedule, you select, you, you're able to select your time zone here and, uh, and everything that you do is, is in that time zone. Whereas before everything was, was bad. It was, all, it was all relative to, to where we were. So yeah, growing pains. So it's nice to see some JMT support in there. Um, yes. Yeah. Next is internationalization for you guys with your your bonnets and your, your crumpets and however you say bonnets things. and crumpets. Yeah, that I'm. That is exactly what British people have. Mm -hmm. um, we sit drinking tea and crumpets um, on top of our bonnets. That's right. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about time zones? Well, Drew, I'll tell you how I feel about time zones, and there's only one true time zone, and it's GMT. Yeah, moving on from that, so Darren doesn't real have a chance to... Real uh, convenient. Real <laughs> convenient. Um, is Imi going to support some form of MSIX app attach? Um, okay, I actually don't know that much about app attach, but we will add support very soon for uh, for app X directly. So when you upload an app X, it'll just say, oh, I know how to install this and it'll do the the and add a provisioning package or whatever it does to to get that on the computer. We've had to do that uh, manually for a couple of clients that we've um, that we packaged. So we've gone over by 10 minutes. So sorry, uh, sorry, everybody. Um, we did have a bit more content uh, to discuss. Uh, we have cut it a bit short. Um, this, this kind of thing, it's amazing how much time actually goes into it when we start talking about uh, things like this. But we're going to be available in the v-imibot uh, channel in the MSP Geek Slack if you've got questions or want to discuss any of the things that we've uh, put forward here any further uh darren thank you very much for your time today yeah with us um, i've thoroughly enjoyed it awesome yeah and if uh, if anybody wants to go and spin up a trial it's free to do uh, you get 30 days on it and uh, i would encourage you to schedule a teams meeting with me where i kind of get your environment set up uh, it usually takes about an hour and we have a i like to have uh, i'll use my machine my test machine for just onboarding it according to what your specifications are and it's uh, it's a lot of fun i enjoy Thank you. So this session will be recorded. We'll be putting it up onto the MSP Geek uh, relevant channels uh, in YouTube um, in in time. Um, and thank you everyone for coming today as well. Um, thank you for joining us and I uh, hope you join us next month for our webinar, which will be around SNMP with uh, Domots, uh, the network monitoring provider. So thank you again darren thank you to thank all you. the people who are here have a wonderful weekend and goodbye Bye.